Good morning. Thank you for coming to this first lecture of the second edition of the International Graduate Seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce the first lecturer, Professor Vincent Semete from France. Uh, Vincent Semete is currently the director of the CNRS Research, which is the center, the Centre de, de Recherche de Chimie Paris. Institut de Recherche de Chimie Paris at Chimie Paris Tech. He received his PhD in 2002 from Strasbourg University and then joined uh, the research group of Professor George Whitesides at Harvard University as a postdoc from 2002 to 2004. He started his research group at the Institut Curie in Paris in 2005 in the field of biomaterials and medical devices and later joined in 2004-14 to Chimie Paris Tech. He is in charge of the university share for urban mines that aims the faster research and education, the faster research in education, in circular economy and particularly recycling materials. His fields of interest are material sciences, and particularly polymer chemistry and engineering, as well as polymer recycling. Professor Sente, welcome to the Tecnológico Nacional de México in Celaya to continue the joint research as a part of the ECOS North program. <laughs> and thank you for accepting to be a part of this uh, second edition of the International Graduate Seminar. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Uh, I would like to, to acknowledge you for your welcome and acknowledge uh, basically the organizing uh, committee for being, being here today. So, uh, my talk is uh, entitled Polymer Material Engineering and uh, Recycling. So, my talk will be divided in two parts, I would say. One part dedicated to uh, what I like very much is engineering basically uh, materials for uh, cell biology and medical devices. And another part, so it is uh, to dedicate it to the recycling of material. Basically, I synthesize and I uh, recycle material and particularly polymer material. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so before to start with uh, the talk, uh, I, I will just introduce um, the, the, the city we are working and particularly the, the, the two institutions uh, we are working in. So particularly the, the PSL University so, uh, and Chimie Paris Tech, so Chimie Paris Tech being the, the one of the components of PSL University. So PSL University is a a uh, university quite recent, created in 2010 only. Uh, so, PSL University stands for Paris uh, Science and Letters. So, it does mean that this university has a, a broad range of education ranging from sciences to basically humanity. It's, uh, there is almost uh, 17,000 students there from uh, bachelor to, to PhD. Uh, any kind of, uh, I would say, uh, science to engineering fields are, are and also arts are uh, representative in those uh, through the, the components of these universities. Science at PSL, uh, uh, it's mainly three engineering schools. So, so basically, it's a little bit uh, like here. We are uh, focusing very much in engineering. Through Chimie Paritech. Chimie Paritech is basically the, the, the one that works in, uh, in chemistry, ESPCI uh, in physics, uh, and me in Paris, uh, so, so a school dedicated to mining and mechanics and robotics also. 
plus ENS, uh, so we could normal supplier to absolutely no it. So a, a wide uh, institution in pretty much all kind of uh, uh, fields, as well as institutes for biology. So uh, PSL University is 28 Nobel Prize and 11 medal uh, field so in mathematics. Uh, and in Shanghai, it's uh, ranked uh, at the, the 14th place. So, okay, for here is the, the, uh, a little bit the, the profile uh, of Pearson University. And I'm working in Pearson Biotech so that was created uh, at the end of 19th century. So at the opposite of the university, it's quite old. Uh, here, basically, the, the university is something quite recent, uh, and it's much more a kind of a system that organizes several uh, old institutions. So it's only 600 uh, students. So we are almost in the same order of magnitude in terms of uh, number of students. We have a lot of international students. Almost 20 to 30 percent of the students are, are uh, coming from different countries like uh, China, Brazil, uh, Russia. We used to have Mexican people. Uh, uh, so, so we should perhaps restart and uh, foster those exchanges. Uh, basically, all the, the, the fields in chemistry are represented in, uh, in this uh, uh, school. And what uh, is really important is the innovation in the school with the, this idea of uh, uh, educate uh, future engineers that they can go to company uh, and also perhaps create by themselves uh, a company and in particular the case in the past with Eugène Chevert that is the, the, the founder of L'Oréal. Currently there is three research labs at Chimie uh, Paritex uh, dedicated to materials, so I'm part of this lab, health and energy. So, now we know a little bit the, the context of my research in Paris. So let's start to, to uh, talk by itself, the scientific talks, with the, uh, next slide, the, the, uh, the parts dedicated to the engineering of polymer materials for biology and nuclear medicine. So when I started my, my own career in 2005, I was interested in uh, the relationship between materials, so when we are talking materials, it's much more polymer, uh, with basically uh, living materials. So it could be cells, it could be cell tissue, it could be organs. Uh, next slide, please. And I was particularly interested in medical devices. So medical devices uh, are constituted by, by main polymers and metals. Uh, so usually polymers that you found are polyurethanes. Silicons, and when you implant those materials, you several interactions come to look you between cells and, uh, and the materials, uh, as well as macromolecules, so proteins, and for cells, it's bacteria and cells. And in turn, you have some complication that could occur, and you can end up with a complication like thrombosis, like infection. So, one of my uh, interest was to uh, get rid of this complication. How to get rid of this complication is to uh, avoid any kind of interaction between all those entities with the material. Uh, so the idea is to suppress typically hydrophobic interaction between those two components. It could also do, uh, it's possible to avoid those interactions by creating monolayers of polymers. Not any kind of polymer. To, to avoid this interaction, you need to mobilize a layer of uh, dense layer polymer and hydrophilic polymer, like polyethylene glycol, polysaccharide, for example. So I spent basically uh, the, the first year of, the, of my career, sorry, next slide, um, by playing with different materials, plastic materials, such as polyimetic saloxanes or polyurethanes. Yeah. 
Um, and by playing with chemical reactions, in order to graft on materials, uh, entities like uh, hydrophilic polymers. So those reactions was hydrocylation for, for uh, polymethyl cyloxanes or transcarbonylation for, for polyethyl. So, uh, in order to end up with a monolayer of uh, polysaccharide or polyethylene glycol, in order to protect the surface. And we can do the same thing with also uh, metals, so for example, titanium, using some other specific reaction like uh, thiolene reaction. So, you will see here we talk a lot about thiolene reaction, it's probably my, my favorite reaction. We have done uh, many works around this reaction in different kinds of applications. My point here is to say that reactivity, synthetic chemistry, can help you to design and create monolayers of polymer on the surface. The only duty that you you need to, to, to feed is to have high, a really efficient reaction and really specific reaction. Uh, in order to have only one reaction that occurs, the, the, basically the grafting of one monolayer of at, at least uh, hydrophilic polymers to, to the substrate. No other secondary reaction that could be uh, that could damage the polymer or uh, may create some problem then for regulation if, if you want to. Apply it for chemical reaction. So then we have analyzed the surfaces uh, through different uh, assays in order to, 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 to evaluate the potential of those uh, monolayers uh, uh, through, for example, protein adsorption, bacterial adhesion, or cell adhesion. And we have shown that there is a clear evidence that with and without uh, this monolayer uh, at the surface of the plastic, of the metal, we can uh, protect or not the, the matter. Uh, so at the bench and at the cellular level, we have shown that there is a clear uh, interest and we can control the cell adhesion using uh, this grafting of uh, hydrogen. So, we have then switched to an in vivo model with a rat, uh, because the evaluation in vitro is nice, but what we, we, we want is to play and to evaluate the system uh, within an animal model. And with a true collaboration with Institute Pasteur, we have clearly shown that medical devices having uh, those monolayers on the surface, I want you to monolayers, here it's a polysaccharide, can protect. Uh, the infection of uh, uh, catheters, and as well as the formation of thrombus uh, within the medical devices. Here it's a, a catheter which I've seen in the rats uh, over a period of one week, two weeks uh, in this case. So there is clearly a benefit uh, in developing bio strategy and grafting monolayer on the surface. What are the future di directions here? Okay, we are scientific chemists. It was nice to work with uh, chemistry, but there is some issue that you need to, to, to take in account. For instance, when you play with reaction, you have to use a solvent. And the problem with chemistry is a solvent. So we were successful with some reactions because we were able to get on them with water. The water is not a big issue but in terms of regulation when you, you, you use water and solvent. But when you start to use organic solvents, you start to swell the substrate, in particular in plastics, damaging and reducing the mechanical properties. Basically. So that's a real limitation if you want to, to go to read the patient, to, 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 to find the application in industry. So the future is to, to avoid a, a kind of chemistry at, at, at the surface. So how to, and to fulfill the, this objective is to develop copolymers, in other words, to, to, to perform the chemistry at the bench, developing copolymers uh, having hydrophilic blocks, 
on a le mot public blocks. Self-assembling de ce polymer qui prend MySource. Les autres MySource, typically soluble in water. We have then a solvent necessary to water the solvent, which is not problematic for the grafting of the medical device. Those MySource can then absorb the materials. And then the hydrophobic block will penetrate the materials. So we are currently working around the strategy. So here is the scheme. It's quite simple, like that. The scenario is, it seems simple and obvious. But the tricky thing is there. You need to choose correctly and predict the, 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 the behavior of the, the polymer to, to have the state where you have the interpretation of the system within the matter. What are the, the expected advantages of such treatment? It's, uh, uh, you don't have any organic solvents in this approach. No reaction are taking place in, at the surface, so, so you don't have any kind of problem in terms of regulation. Right? And this, sorry. Uh, the last one, uh, please. Yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, the, the, um, this interpenetration system is the equivalent of creating a bond, covalent bond. So, so we hope to have at the end a system that will be as efficient as the system described before where we were using chemistry directly at the surface. So this is ongoing currently uh, in uh, our uh, uh, laboratory. And now I would like to talk about another project dealing this time with the, the migration of cells in, uh, in 3D, in ECM, so uh, this stuff stands for extracellular matrix. Biology basically went to this. Biology studies cells, they grow cells in petri dish. So typically on surfaces made from uh, polystyrene, so 3D surfaces. What is the reality? In the body, it turns out that cells are much more in contact with fibers in cells. In pretty much all locations. So, we need to develop tools having fibers to really study the behavior of cells, particularly in the migration. So, what are the, the, the fibers in, in nature? Basically, nature. What matter is the collagen fibers. Cells are migrating collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are quite difficult to study, uh, to manipulate. And also, you cannot tune uh, the, the, the fibers, the, the length, uh, how if it's bending, they are susceptible. So, there is a, a, a need uh, in order to develop uh, fibers that can control at the same time the length, the, the form, the, uh, the rigidity. So we started the project. Uh, and the idea was to create fibers using photopolymerization. And particularly, uh, particular photopolymerization is the two photo uh, polymerization. We are using typically a pulse laser, and we are able to. Uh, to basically uh, polymerize at the focal point and by moving the stage containing the monomer, so this gray part is a, a liquid monomer, you can polymerize uh, any kind of surface. So typically, here are some examples of the first structure that we, we have designed. So it's not ambitious in terms of fibers, <laughs> but it was a start. Uh, so it gives quite nice structure that you can image by ACM. And uh, here is just a picture of the, the setup. Because when you think about this kind of technology, you might think that it's quite complicated, it requires a lot of uh, uh, sophisticated equipment. That's not the case. It's just a simple microscope with a, a, a piezo, that means in 3D, uh, with a, a tiny laser. We are using a nanosecond laser. Uh, really small box. 
So, okay, we have the machine <laughs> that allows you to, 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 uh, to build any kind of structure, what kind of material we can use. So, here again, we are using uh, polymers, uh, and particular polymers, thiolene resins. Why? Because it's, as I told you, a very, uh, very interesting uh, chemistry that is very efficient uh, and it uh, uh, involves two kinds of molecules. One having thio reacting with one molecule containing alkene. And if you add a little photonificator, you shine light, you polymerize. So you have these two guys, so it's the, the, the two components that we are using actually in our formulation. Uh, what is nice, you can control the ratio of these two components. So you can adjust this. Why? Because by adjusting it, you can adjust the, the some mechanical property of your polymer, again, once it's polymerized. And also, you can end up at the end with an excess of thio on your resin, or an excess of alkene, which means that you are able to modify the surface of the microsurface. So we have performed many trials in order to characterize our system, and what we have seen is that our system we are able to, to, to photopolymerize from ratio ranging from 2 to 1 to 1 to 4 in terms of ratio. Uh, ranging, uh, making our uh, system very flexible in terms of mechanical properties, as well as in terms of possibilities uh, to, to draft the molecule itself. So, what is nice with also uh, thiolene chemistry, you can analyze it very easily just by infrared. Uh, and you can, you have some descriptors, so I won't enter into detail, but you can know precisely where, I mean, if your uh, polymerization was efficient or not, at this stage you, you are typically. And if you graft molecule, you can have an idea of if you have at the end grafted your molecule just by interacting, which is quite nice. Another point about thiolene, <laughs> we have used uh, for, for other projects, in particular in collaboration with ITC, and uh, particularly uh, Ferdinand de Christian Lopez and Sophia Villegas, to uh, graft, uh, uh, to modify the, the, the graphene oxide in order to perform chemistry on it. And we tried many types of reaction. And the one that gives the best results in terms of efficiency, in terms of specificity, I mean, the, the fact that the thio involved in the reaction will react with one alkene uh, of the graphene sign is very uh, very specific. Uh, and it turns out from this study that thiolene is probably the reaction that reacts one order of magnitude greater than the other uh, reaction. So it's really a reaction that is inefficient, that you can control also with light. So it allows you to address locally the chemistry if you want, once again, uh, build structure and food, for example. So let's go back to our structure. We have seeded cell on it, the structure. So uh, the, this honeycomb structure that we have seen, and this open structure, uh, we start to have some fibers. And you know, again, I won't enter into detail, but we have seen that cells were behaving differently just by controlling the geometry. For example, for epithelial cells, if you put epithelial cells on those kind of structure, so those honeycombs, they produce uh, protrusion. So that means the cell is bigger than obviously those honeycombs, but they will fill all those honeycombs. It's what you can see here with this red stuff. It's just a membrane that goes in and fills the, the whole cavity. 
And if you put the same cell on the open structure, they stay just on top and then don't enter in. For an Ortega cell, it's the opposite. If you put the Ortega cell to your structure, they, they try to enter them and grow protrusion, a very long protrusion, something like 10, 20 microns. Uh, you can see that here, for example, you have the body of the cell here, and the, the protrusion is very long. And at the opposite, the, the, in this microstructure, this, this microstructure was surrounded by those kind of structure, and here it's completely empty. So there is no So you have two, with two types of cells, two opposite uh, behaviors. Uh, what we have seen also, we have, uh, we have seen, sorry, that here, uh, this behavior, because we are collaborating with biologists, the behavior that is uh, really characteristic and meet typically in biology, in biological context, it's a phenotype called tip-like cell. Uh, you can see it. Uh, when there is a vein that starts to grow. So it's the first cells that uh, protrude and progress into the tissue to grow the, 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 the vein. Uh, so what is amazing here is that just a structure, microstructure, can uh, induce this phenotype. I will skip this slide. Okay, so let's be more ambitious. And let's go towards a uh, fibrous, very long one. So to do so, we have tried to, to, to design more ambitious structure and to start to play with architecture somehow. So we have designed so, some uh, fibrous system uh, in the form of tunnels with some support like that. So about the wide range, some, something like uh, 100 micron, cell is 10 micron. Uh, with supports like that to, to uh, maintain our fibers. So we can, here again, uh, image our uh, structures by ACM, by uh, optical, uh, classical optical microscopy. And when we put cell on it, so cells, yeah, it's by the way, with cells, you can see that cells enter in. So our uh, system uh, is not. Contrast is good here, but we, we, you can see all the tunnels here, and you can see that cells start to invade. They are, here there is two cells, but they are not really migrating. Why? Because they need all those uh, supports here, and we found them in the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, it's those supports, they prefer to, to stick to the supports and they are not migrating to, to, the, to the fiber. So, somehow, it's nice to play with fibers, but we need to pay attention to, to the design of our, our architecture. But we, we have seen some interesting things. Uh, for instance, in this uh, video, uh, so done by light sheet microscopy, we can see that cells uh, are moving in and are playing with fibers. They are completely uh, uh, deforming uh, fibers. So there is an idea here also to control uh, the mechanical properties of, uh, of the fibers uh, in order to, to study the interaction with it. So it's what we have done with this second set of, uh, of structure. Uh, this time being much more uh, ambitious. And here, it was successful because what, when we see cells on it, seeds, cells are interacting with the fibers, going uh, back and forth uh, to, to those fibers. So we are much more close from the, 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 the initial uh, uh, boat that was creating uh, a 3D system to, to study uh, uh, the interaction of cells with, with fibers. We, we are talking about rigidity. What is nice with polymer, you can play rigidity. 
by controlling the number of crossings in your, in your system. In other words, here we have uh, photopolymerization. If you play with the extra time, you can play with the DVD. At low exposure time, you will have a low DVD. At high exposure time, you will have a high DVD. What we can see is that in cell, cells, when we see cells, then we the system that is low DVD, they behave completely uh, differently from the high DVD. At low DVD, cell goes in and they deform completely the, uh, the fibers. They deform, but if you sell them uh, goes away, they relax the deformation. And we, we can recover the form of uh, the fiber, so there is, uh, they are really elastic. As opposed to, to the system where we have high rigidity and there is almost no, no deformation. So we are characterizing this system, and the idea is to, in the future, to link the deformation of those fibers with the, the, the force that applies sense locally uh, on the fibers. So for that, you have seen images before with sense. It was probably it was difficult to, to, to study them. So there is a student that analyze images and keep only the channel uh, with the fluorescent uh, fibers. And is able to, to keep at the end just a movie with the, the motion of the fiber without the sense. So the next step is to link the deformation of each fibers with the force distribution along those uh, uh, fibers. Let's be more ambitious. <laughs> Before we try a line system of fibers, now we can try something that starts to be free. So two, two step, two, two stage of, uh, of fibers, perfectly aligned and orthogonally aligned. And we let them uh, we, we, we make a little bit old in order to, to allow cells to go through. So here it's what we observe, and here again we can also play with the DVD, and we can see that cells are moving in the system and deform cells. It deforms fibers, as opposed to, to the systems where we, we, the system is rigid and cells are moving uh, into the, the this array of fibers, choosing somehow the direction. So we are playing with the dynamics, the sense, keeping in mind that also we have the rigidity to uh, make rules about cell migration into, into uh, the complex system. So what the future? We are optimistic. We have seen that with one single uh, polymer, we can do a lot of things. But the future is to still continue playing with geometry, play with geometry and chemistry, to have, for example, hybrid system with one material combined to another, to play with uh, chemistry in order to have, for example, adhering system as opposed to uh, systems that are not adhering in front of cells. So here, for example, it's a trial, it's a sort of chess master <laughs> game, where we succeed to put cells only on uh, here, it's the, the, the reddish uh, square, because we can control, uh, the, the, let's say, the addition property of some, uh, some material. And obviously, try to have material that you can play with by a stimulant in order to have a functionality that appear or disappear through a stimulant. And it's something that we start to play with, with uh, uh, DSA, for example. So DSA is a bovine serum albumin, where we are able to polymerize bovine serum albumin and to be, uh, here again, 
in such ions. And with those systems, it's interesting because it's made from proteins. Proteins you can use proteins, cells can be proteins, and so those systems degrade by themselves. So it's something also that we, we explore, we are exploring. So the, the use first of uh, natural polymer proteins that can also over time uh, be uh, modified to end up with, for example, evolution. Okay, so I will stop here for, for this, this aspect. I will just finish my talk with the second part. So it was an example of what we are doing in order to create materials, but more and more, uh, we are in contact with industry. They are asking us to, 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 to a question around the fate of materials. What they, they, they behave after they typically the, the, the end of life of material products. So, as chemists, we can build and we can destroy, recycle, uh, also material. And I'm pretty sure that you guys it will be probably one of your du duty in the future uh, to uh, pay attention to what you are producing, uh, what you put on the market. So, we are doing that. In our lab, in the context of e-waste, e-waste, we are producing something like 54 million tons a year worldwide. Only 17% are uh, properly collected and, and treated. So we don't know what happened to the 80%. Probably they are incinerated, they are uh, landfill. Uh, there is a sort of uh, non-documented uh, phase of, of this. Uh, because you waste time. But there is a, a real attention currently, particularly in Europe, about uh, the, the end of life of product in that time. So it was a question of how, uh, what, what we have to do. So we have to, to, to reuse, to, to, uh, to, to recycle. Uh, why? Because uh, it's nice for the environment when you put those waste in. in uh, you landfill, you, 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 you incinerate, you release, particularly you waste a lot of toxic substances, heavy metals. Uh, when you burn, you have dioxins and, and so on. And also, there is an opportunity is to recover metal, uh, valuable metal, met, met, metal, and also uh, plastics. Heavy waste, it's quite simple. Uh, you have a lot of metals. Half of the, uh, the composition of e-waste are metals, but there is also uh, plastics. Uh, plastics is quite complicated in e-waste. You have uh, valuable plastics, and you have also plastics that are not anymore usable because they contain uh, regulated substances. And you have also some minor products like printed sticker gloves, but they have a huge value. Why? Because you have all your smartphone, <laughs> but there is in, in, in uh, the smartphone, for example, a lot of gold, a uh, lot of fresh metal, uh, silver, platinum, and so on, cobalt. Uh, so so th there is uh, an opportunity here to, to, uh, to have this, uh, this material back again to the market, particularly in the context of crisis, economic crisis. You can work uh, in, in Europe, for example. So uh, there is a lot of uh, incentive uh, policy to to, uh, to recover uh, faster. Another point is when you recover metals so versus uh, versus classic aluminium, there is a gain a gain in terms of water consumption, electric consumption, CO2 footprint. Sometimes it's by order of magnitude. So, so you need to mind that. To finish, I will just talk about two examples that we are dealing with. It's the recycling of pollutants. Pollutants, you have it in waste. They are using it for, uh, to insulate fridges, prison, for example. But 
full maintenance, you have it everywhere, like uh, for your shoes, for your uh, for building insulation, for, for many things. Punisher, mattress, uh, you have a lot of content. And there is no recycling solution. Uh, with, there is minor rules. It's the, the recycling, but usually it's for mechanical recycling for, for post-production uh, product. And usually it's for insulation one. Uh, and there is one chemical, it's the glycolysis, but usually you downgrade the production to produce some polyol that goes back to, 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 uh, to the synthesis of new uh, polyol. So there is a need for new strategy based on the decolonization. So as I told you, we have to use. And what we have used is K3 in order to depolymerize polyethanes in order to produce by a specific reaction, transvitalization, dimethyl carbonate, and polymer. So we are fully cut cutting the, the, um, the bonds, the urethane bonds, to generate these two guys that you can recover, because they're stable, particularly the, the dimethyl carbonate. And these dimethyl carbonates can be used in order to generate back again. Uh, I die isocenate to feed back again the, 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 the polyethane industry. Or you can modify this formulation to recover new polyethanes from uh, the crude uh, that come in from the, the post process. Another example of uh, depolymerization is to use depolymerization in order to leach metal, to liberate metal. You may know LED. LED is a nice uh, technology. It's really a technological breakthrough. You have it almost everywhere. Uh, and they start to appear in this. The problem is you don't know really how to recycle. And particularly the LED company. Why? Because it's electronics. There is a lot of heat. And inside, Theoretical value is linked now to the goal. Why? Because there is a lot of gold in those components, but since we are not recycling it, we are losing this value. So there is a need to, to, to develop technologies to, to, to recover those metals. And so, so the gold, where, where is the gold in this LED sheets? They are, it's the connector between the, the electrodes and the, the semiconductor that produce that. And on top, what you have, you have this yellow part that you, you see when you have a look at the uh, LED uh, uh, component. It's made from polymethyl taloxanes, so polymer, that interrupts uh, what we call uh, the YAG. So YAG it means Ethereum Aluminium Carnet. It's the, the, uh, the, the component that converts the blue light coming from this, uh, this sheet into uh, a white light. Any kind of white light, you have, you know, the uh, warm uh, light, the, the cold, uh, cold uh, light, and so on, by adjusting the, the, the composition of those three So, what we have, see, what, what we have done, we have tried different depolarization techniques in order to remove this, uh, this uh, lead, lead, so, so, so this uh, luminophore, in order to have an access to uh, the value, so I mean, all those uh, semiconductors connected with uh, those pole boy, in order to recover by classical technology, again, hydraulic energy, the method, selectively, so gold, silver, copper, with laser ID and really pure. So how we do that? We just depolymerize the methyl cyclosan by playing with a, a region. So, so it's TBAP, it's um, tetra uh, butyl aluminum fluoride. In fact, it's the, the fluoride that attack the, the, the silicon in the in the field. to have an access once again. So, 
this method is really uh, soft because when once we we remove this this, uh, this polymer, the LED is still functioning. So that this is a proof that by this technology, it's soft enough to maintain the the, the gold. Yeah, you can see the gold. Huh? The, the shiny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, it's good. Uh, and, and that means that in, in the second step, we can recover this value, uh, is, which is which was not possible before when you have the LED uh, intact uh, because the, 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 the silicon protects the, the, the value. So I will stop here with this example. Uh, I will just analyze. My, my group, my, my students, uh, and also uh, Ferdinando and, uh, and Sophia for, for this nice collaboration and invitation uh, today. So the, the discussion is open. If you have questions, do not hesitate. Any kind of question. Thank you. Thank you. have a question, please let me know. I can give you. Thank you, Doctor, for your presentation. Your work is very interesting. So, my question is the next one. You say that you want to try to do a photopolymerization with a soft biomolecule. This kind of process can affect us, uh, this kind of biomolecule as collagen or as or, or all those kind of proteins. Is the, the polymerization affecting the structure? Yes. That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's what we are uh, trained to, um, to uh, we are studying it. In fact, and there is several answers. So if the question is, do you maintain the chemical structure of the protein? I would say yes, uh, because then when we put in front of the proteins, we can cut the protein. So there is no problem about that. Now, if your question is, OK, if you polymerize an enzyme, do you, have, do you maintain the activity? This is what we are studying now. And this is not obvious. The first uh, answer that I can give is that we have performed some preliminary trial. We are losing a part of the, of the activity. And I would say it's normal. You shine light, locally you put a lot of energy, and probably you have a little bit of denaturation. And there is a link between denaturation and then the, the functionality of design, but it could be also a uh, uh, an antibody, if you put an antibody, you have a, re you have a recognition site, and this recognition site may be affected. But we can keep some activity, uh, so uh, for enzyme or for antibody. So, what we don't know currently is that if we can play with the condition of polymerization, because we have done tried all the, the, the possibility to see if we can increase this uh, and avoid this uh, denaturation. But it's part of uh, our investigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any more questions, please? Good morning. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very good. Uh, my question is about the when you present the, some measures and uh, did you use uh, some kind of I don't know sensors or some kind of software to make your I don't know your graphicals your different kinds of colors that you presented and uh, you use a uh, sensor or, I don't know no uh, that's a really good question in fact uh, there is two ideas uh, one is Experimental. So, in other words, because we are polymerizing uh, tiny fibers, but as fibers, 
mais, mais il emmène notre vie, des douleurs, euh, what I did to tell you about, in fact, those favors are not really if you take the cross section, it's not really, it's not really a synonym. It's much more uh, an ellipse. So, obviously, you have an impact then in, in terms of liquidity. So, you need somehow to measure directly uh, the rigidity of the fiber. It's what we are doing using IFM, uh, atomic force microscopy, to measure locally at different uh, points the, 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 the rigidity. And then there is, so, to put parameter in our system. And there is this other question of, okay, we have images, and how we process images to obtain them uh, and to play with forces. So here, it's a lot of uh, image analysis in 3D to have all the displacement of fibers uh, in 3D to then obtain uh, locally all the force distribution. Because the system is quite easy when you have a bar, you push on it, you have what we call in France, uh, flambage, so, so you have a deformation. Now, with cells, you have seen that it's, uh, you have many cells, you have many deformations, sometimes it's very local, so it's a little bit more complex. But there is also this part that is quite challenging, and the student that is working on it is spending a lot of time. Well, um, thank you for your presentation and for seeing today. I have uh, two questions. The first one is, what is the use, useful life of medical devices based on the on a layer of polymer that we present? Uh, to, uh, so, so the initial idea is to avoid any kind of complication. Uh, basically, the real complication when you use medical devices is the interaction with cells or protein. Uh, why? Because if you have protein that absorb, you will end up with thrombus formation because you have platelets, uh, fibrinogen, so it's a component of the blood, it's protein that will absorb on and then generate a, lot, a huge cascade where you have platelet adhesion, so it's cell adhesion that will produce in turn a, 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 a fibrin that will uh, produce at some point a blood clot inside catheter outside. So, in fact, when you analyze all this cascade, the initial point is the absorption. So, if you avoid the absorption of protein, you are in the business. Okay. The same thing with, um, with bacteria. The, the, the problem of bacteria colonization in, uh, in medical devices is the addition. If you are able to avoid the initial addition of bacteria, you, work, you will avoid the colonization. What we, we see clearly in our study with uh, in vivo study, <laughs> if we put, we inoculate some bacteria in the device, so we are using uh, luminescent bacteria, bacteria start to adhere, and then they grow, they grow, they, they form a biofilm, and the, the, the light is appearing all along the catheter. So here again, once you suppress the initial vision, you don't have uh, any more this problem. Or you reduce by, by order of magnitude. The problem is, uh, in, this, uh, in this strategy, is to uh, reach the industry and to reach the patient. And there is so many regulations, particularly in Europe, uh, and it, it's important to uh, <laughs> we, we, we don't have uh, to, to, to have any bad things <laughs> uh, having those, those in, in, in terms. Uh, so you need to, to, to pay attention to uh, reactants, you need to pay attention to, and, and it was uh, something that we discovered uh, during uh, our study, it's the solvatation polymer. Any kind of solvatation, even a small uh, uh, percentage, reduce uh, drastically the mechanical problem. Mm -hmm. So you can use only water, I call it a solvent, but other than that, it's really difficult to do. Right. 
the gate thing here at the top. And the next question is, why are you considering all the hexagonal shape of the structure that you are present to us? And not another one, so like uh, triangular shapes. Ah. <laughs> In fact, you, uh, what is nice with the system, you have no restriction in terms of uh, freedom. Uh, the two photos that they give you can do any kind of structure. <laughs> Fibers, uh, small animal, uh, clothes, wh whatever you want. The problem is much more you start to play with architecture. Sometimes you, you have an idea, wow, well, yes, let's, play, let's have a long fiber, 500. <laughs> Uh, micro, you start to, to design it, and then you remove the, the, the monomer that is not polymerized, and you see at the end that the structure is falling down. In fact. It's a little bit like uh, you want to build a <laughs> house, uh, you need uh, a minimal uh, knowledge, a minimal of uh, requirements to have this structure that uh, stay at the end. So, in fact, we, we, we do have uh, those problems about designing, having you know, the, the right uh, structure at the right position to maintain it. Uh, and sometimes, as you can see, set to pick up the stick <laughs> at the support and not to go in the, into, the, into the fiber. Thank you. But it's a, a little bit, you play, you try, and uh, it's like that you, you, <laughs> you are making progress. Thanks, sir, for sharing your time with us. Can I ask two questions? Okay. Uh, the first one is, is there is an optimal rigidity where the cells grow? Probably, I would say probably. Uh, now we don't have the results yet. Why? Because we are still, we don't have the full uh, conversion of the rigidity that we have with our synthetic materials versus what is collagen of nature. So we need to perform all the study that we, we, we plan to do about having the systematic study where we are measuring uh, the rigidity with, with AFM and linked the same behavior systematically with uh, rigidity. So we are collecting data for the moment, but yes, we can see differences between something that is soft versus something that is rigid. And for the moment, it's difficult to say Talk about fiber. But what is known uh, in terms, if you have flat surfaces, cells behave dif differently between uh, uh, rigidity. They use what we call durotaxy. So there is many papers showing that if you have a heavy crossing uh, gel versus a soft one, cell would prefer something more rigid. Right now. And uh, I, sorry, I did not understand if you are trying to combine the rigidity in a layer or the layer. Ah, uh, yes, because I started with the, my talk with this. Uh, what is really life, in fact, it's a complex fiber that goes everywhere. For the moment, we are <laughs> very far from this situation. And the idea is much more to gain knowledge about uh, very well-defined fibers with a known orientation and to go step by step, in fact. So yes, the idea is to have a good 3D system, probably having a very multi-layered uh, system three, four, five, I don't know, and study systematically the cells in it, how they, they close the system, how they go from uh, one fiber to another, uh, if they prefer uh, uh, fiber rigid versus uh, soft. You can play with fiber that is rigid in one side, soft in the other side. You do uh, the orientation, you have many things in it. So to have rules about the migration of cells in a completely synthetic system. But this completely synthetic system, where you have a control, uh, can give you at the end few reasons, as opposed to the system where uh, biologists are playing with uh, uh, ACM, so, so uh, 
pas cellular matrix, it's very difficult to control this. I don't know if you, there is some biology, biochemist here, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's really changing. Uh, working with collagen basically. Uh, And finally, um, about the left light, about the light, left light, uh, you are already recycling the, 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 Uh, for the moment, so we are waiting uh, in France. We are uh, recycling uh, and the treatment of the waste are really well organized. Uh, there is a, a NIC organism that is on top of company, recycling company in my side, and produce on one and research. <laughs> uh, so basically, it's, uh, I'm in charge of a chair of research and they, 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 they give the support to post research. And at this stage, this feature, this research, there is a student that is trying to, to see if we can create a line to recover. What you have to imagine, if you give me right now one ton of uh, LED components, I can recover something like two kilos of gold. Now, if I'm going to a gold mine, I don't need to work the lines here. The maximum that you can get is only 10 grams from one, one ton of ores. So it's by far much more interesting to mines from e waste, PCB uh, electronics, than mines uh, in natural mines. One last question, please. Hi. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have one question. How do you control the, the, the rigidity of the fibers? You mean control? Uh, so uh, we can uh, perform the measurements. Uh, And you can also extrapolate. Also, as I told you, we can uh, use infrared. In infrared by Um, measuring ratio, you can have an idea of the, 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 the extent of polymerization, of course, but what is what, what we are working on currently is to measure really locally the, the, uh, the rigidity by air. For the moment, we, we can extrapolate the presence versus what we have. <laughs> which is not the reality for many reasons. So we need absolutely to perform this local measurement. So yes, we have an ID, but we don't have the real value of the units. So that's why we are waiting on the data. Thanks. Thank you very much. What? I think that it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Martin, uh, for the very interesting talk. In the name of the organizing committee of the International Graduate Seminar, I would like to give you uh, an acknowledgement signed by the General Chair, Professor Indro Vasquez. Uh, I, I will read. Uh, The Tecnológico Nacional de México en Celaya acknowledges the participation of Pansan Semete as a speaker with the conference Polymer Materials Engineering and Recycling in the uh, International Seminar of, uh, International Graduate Seminar uh, celebrated uh, on October 19 of 2022. Thank you very much, Professor. We have a small present for you, which is uh, traditional sweets uh, from Celaya. <laughs> so I hope that you enjoy them. Yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> Thank you all for your participation and uh, your question. There was a specific question. So I'm available and I will be around. So if you have some other questions, if you want to discuss, I'm available. Do not hesitate. Thank you.
Thank you all. Agradecemos, agradecemos su presencia. Muchas gracias por asistir a esta sesión del seminario. Eh, por favor, continúen con las actividades de, del seminario para que continúen con nuestras pláticas. Muy agradecido.